morning, everybody. We're glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. Um, let's open in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for watching over us this week and for protecting us and for guiding us through uh, the different challenges of life that we've faced. Thank you, Lord, for walking with us through the different joys that we've experienced and blessings that you've given to us. And so we come here this morning to, be, to, to worship you together and to give thanks together and to show our gratefulness and gratitude for what you've done. We come here together to worship your name, for you are worthy of all of our worship, because uh, without you, we can do nothing. And so we want to praise and worship you and thank you. We come here this morning together to encourage each other and to, um, to connect and to, um, to allow you to work through us to say the powerful and encouraging words to each other that will be something that we'll, we can take from here and that will be helpful. We come here this morning to lay our needs and our burdens before you, to lay our, the cares and concerns we have for family members and friends and for ourselves, knowing that, uh, that you care and that, uh, that you do hear and answer prayer. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be very present here, that you would uh, help us, Lord, to be aware of you and aware of your presence. Give us open hearts and open minds to what you want to say to us, that we may leave this place in some way changed. And so we just uh, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to be together. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A few weeks ago, we, uh, we shared a, a time in worship where we, we did a, a scripture reading and we, we included some, some physical gestures to sort of reinforce, why are you laughing? To sort of reinforce um, the, the ideas in the words of the psalm that we were reading together. And um, since then, I've sort of given that a bit more thought, and I thought we could be more intentional about that. We could actually do a bilingual scripture reading. I got, you're scared, right? Rick, you look scared. You look very nervous. Okay, the cool thing is the second language is sign language. It's American Sign Language, which is a proper language in its own right, with its own um, grammar and its own slang and its own like swear words which you can look up on the internet please not now maybe later but it's a proper language spoken by millions of people around the world and you know cards on the table my personal competence in sign language uh, is limited to being able to spell my name and to say thank you and I can say Jesus because we learned that in Sunday school Good Sunday school, I know, right? You learn stuff. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to read some passages that are taken from Psalm 143. And we are going to sort of emphasize the key words as we come across them in sign language. So I will speak and show you the signs, and then you will repeat after me, okay? So this is the way it's going to go. There are days, now you guys, there are days, there you go, when my spirit is weak within me. My spirit is weak within me. There are days when fear overcomes my heart. Good. There are days when my spirit fails, there are days when I come to the limit of myself. So I choose to remember, to remember. I meditate on all you have done. Let me feel your reliable love. Let me feel your reliable love. 
Because God, I trust in you. God, I trust in you. Let me understand the way I should go. Because God, I long for you. Rescue me from my enemies. Because God, I need your protection. Teach me to follow your will. Because God, you are my God. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us on those days when we are weak, when we feel fear, the days when we fail, the days when we come to the limit of what we can do. We thank you that you make it possible for us to remember, no, to remember, to meditate. Thank you that you are reliable. Thank you that you help us to understand and that you do rescue us from our enemies. We pray that you will walk with us as we do our best to follow you. Amen. From 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to continue looking through 1 Peter using as our guide a book by Charles Swindoll called Hope Again, When Life Hurts and Dreams Fade. And uh, Paul and I were looking through the church library at the back, and there are a couple of books by Charles Swindoll in the, swing, the circle rack back there at the, near the top if you want to check them out. He's a great author, both theologically deep and yes, yet very simple and practical as well. Uh, he came to Toronto about 15 years ago, and my sister and I decided we want to go hear him speak. He spoke at Queensway Cathedral, which is a church that holds 4,000 people. My sister and I got there 10 minutes before the thing started, and the place was full. We had to stand at the back, with our backs against the back wall, with about 100 other people, just to be able to listen. And um, he is one of those few times in life where a speak, preacher spoke for an hour, and when he was done, I was kind of like, that's it? You're done? <laughs> I thought you were going to speak for a while. <laughs> it just, you know, it was just, you were able to take in all that he said, and it was just so easy to, to listen to. And his writing is the same as well. So, um, so yeah, I recommend to you, if you're looking for something to read over the next month or so, um, something by Charles Swindoll would be a good place to go, and Paul can help you out with that if you wanted to buy something at his bookstore. But First Peter chapter 1, starting to read at verse 13, it says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so your faith and your hope are in God. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it teaches us. Thank you, Lord, how the lessons that Peter wanted to pass on to his readers back in 70 AD or so has been recorded through the centuries so that your word speaks to us here today in 2020. And applies to our lives as well. And I pray, Lord God, that you would take my weak words and that you would infuse them with your power so that they would speak to all of our hearts, mine included, so that we would come away from this place with a fresher understanding of who we are in you and who you are and how you want us to live. Open our hearts and our minds this morning, we pray. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. And Lord, take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. What's the first thing you think about when you hear the word temptation? 
is something that's as old as the Garden of Eden, something that's been part of human experience since the beginning of time. Temptation is something sometimes that's addressed through simplistic answers like just say no. Sometimes temptation is seen as something to be sought after. There's a well-known reality show recently called Temptation Island. It's the place where the contestants want to go. Temptation is joked about sometimes in TV commercials. Sometimes people don't take temptation seriously at all. The 19th century novelist Oscar Wilde wrote that the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. Not really a good formula for a disciplined life. Some people obsess over temptation and give it too much thought. Others don't consider it to be an issue at all. Temptation, by definition, involves the pull, the desire, the attraction to do something that goes against one's values and morals. It involves a choice between doing something right or doing something wrong. Some temptation being the emotions that would kind of draw you and pull you towards the wrong. Now, usually temptation is probably more dealt with in a church setting in a youth group rather than here in grown-up church on a Sunday morning. But as we go through the various stages of life, we will always face various temptations to go against what we know to be the way that God has created us to live. These temptations may change over the years or they may stay the same. But either way, we need to get a handle on how to deal with them and how to address them so that we don't end up getting tripped up in our spiritual walk with God. For to be a true temptation in the spiritual sense, it must be prompting us to sin. And it is sin that stands between us and God. It is sin that gets in the way of us living the lives of purpose that God has created for each one of us to live. And so as I said, we're going to focus, use another chapter from Charles Swindoll's book, Hope Again, as as our parameters for what we're going to talk about, the idea of hope beyond temptation. But before we get into it too much, I want to lay down a couple of fundamental truths about temptation. First of all, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. Being tempted in and of itself is part of the human experience of living in a fallen world. The enemy of our souls, the devil, we should know by now, doesn't play fair. He will take someone with a very sensitive conscience and begin to tempt them to, know, to do something they know they shouldn't. And then if they don't, he'll, he can't shame them for doing something wrong. He'll begin to shame them for even allowing themselves to be tempted in the first place. But being tempted in and of itself is not a sin. Giving in is, but don't allow the enemy to guilt you into shame just because you're tempted. God is aware that we all face temptation. Swindoll comments on how good it would be if once we're saved and become a Christian, God would just, you know, take us up to heaven immediately to live with him in the perfection of heaven, free from disease, free from sin, free from temptation. But God didn't do that. He saved us, and then he has a purpose for us remaining here. Swindoll writes, don't think for a minute that the Lord has made a mistake in leaving us here. We are his light in a dark world. Jesus has a purpose for us remaining here. And knowing that that means we'll be facing temptation, he prays this prayer for his disciples in John chapter 17, and he asks God the Father to protect his disciples, to protect us. Swindoll points out that Jesus doesn't ask the Father to isolate his disciples from the world, but rather to insulate them to keep them from the evil one. Sometimes we may just start to think that to to deal with our problems and our temptations, we should just isolate from the world. But God is calling us to go into the world, but protected and insulated by the power of the Holy Spirit. So temptation in and of itself is not sinful. Secondly, a second foundational idea is because temptation by definition means being pulled to do something wrong, involves a choice between right and wrong, then temptation will only be felt by those who have a deep sense of what is right and what is wrong. I told you before about a speaker I heard in Bible college, so some of you may have heard the story before, some of you not. Um, He was one of our denominational leaders, 
And as speakers sometimes do, he kind of made a big buildup of what he, about what he was going to tell us. He went on for two or three minutes about this is an important truth that, that every Christian leader needs to know. We need pastors and leaders and Christians in general who, who they need this more than anything. And I got out my pen and paper and I'm like, oh, I'm here in Bible college. I'm going to learn neat stuff here. I'm going to write this down, this, this amazing truth that he's going to tell us. And then he said, the church needs leaders who know the difference between right and wrong. And so I was kind of disappointed. I put my paper away, and I'm like, that's, yeah, duh. <laughs> but 20 years later, I still remember that more than most other things I heard in Bible college. And I realized that what he said bore a lot of truth. Society in general has such a distorted view of what is right and what is wrong. And in many instances, the two have actually switched places. Yet if we're going to live lives for Jesus that make a difference, if we're going to be spiritual leaders in our home, spiritual leaders in the church, in society, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to build within us a strong discernment to know the difference between right and wrong and to be able to act on it. Because if we buy into society's worldview, if we begin to believe that right or wrong are blurred or, or they're relative to the individual or, or that they're even non-existent, then the whole concept of temptation is pointless. Because to someone with a little concept of right and wrong, temptation is nothing more than their personal desires or their personal wants or the choices that they make in the pursuit of happiness. But God's plan, God's plan for our lives is so completely different. Swindoll writes that God's ways are often uncomfortable, but the world system is designed to make us comfortable to give us pleasure, to gain our favor, and ultimately to win our support. The philosophy of the world system is totally at odds with the philosophy of God. May I suggest that one canary in the mind to tell us which system we are buying into is temptation. For if you don't find temptation to be an issue because you feel, well, whatever choice I make is valid, then you're probably starting to buy into the world system. But as you buy into God's system of life, the things, things that you do that maybe never bothered you before will become the home field for battles with temptation because your sense of right and wrong has been heightened by the Holy Spirit. I remember reading somewhere years ago that becoming a Christian opens up a whole new capacity for people to feel crummy. And that's because what never bothered you before has suddenly become an issue of temptation, suddenly become an issue of conscience. And as you grow as a Christian, you begin to feel those pangs of conscience increase increasingly over things that were inconsequential to you before. But that's a good thing. It shows you're growing. It shows you're growing in the Lord. As Swindoll said, God's ways are often uncomfortable but they are the way we grow. They're the way we fulfill God's purpose for our lives. The challenge that temptation brings is the challenge to be different from the world. The challenge to do things God's way and not our own way and not society's way. And in our passage from 1 Peter, the apostle calls, uh, in our passage from 1 Peter, the apostle calls um, this being sober in spirit, being obedient children, not conforming to our former lusts, he says, being holy as God is holy. The word holy has a bad rap, I think, in today's society. People either see it as unattainable and beyond their reach, so why bother, or it's something that will ruin your fun. But the word holy just means being set apart. When you become a Christian, God has put his seal upon you and he has set you apart for his purposes for your life. And when you become a Christian, you have decided that you want to begin to live a life that is set apart. No longer will you be satisfied to live life like, like you used to when the world's way of doing things was your comfort zone. Your eyes have been opened that, that hey, there's, there's more to life than this. God's purpose, God has a purpose in creating you. And you want to do all you can to live out that purpose. To do so, you are set apart by God 
as his child. And, and you set yourselves apart from the way of, ways of this world so that you can more accurately and more successfully follow that purpose. Swindoll outlines a number of ways to live a life of hope beyond temptation. And one is, to, is just what we've been talking about, to, to wake up early, to wake up every morning, not necessarily early, I don't do early, but to wake up every morning with this conscience prayer that you will set yourself apart for the Lord every day, that you will set apart each and every area of your life to God as the Lord of your life. When your life is focused on what you've been set apart for, the temptations that come won't be quite as appealing. Verse 17 of our passage tells us to conduct ourselves in fear throughout the, our time here on earth. And Swindoll suggests, and the version we read actually, throws in the word reverence, reverent fear, would give a clearer picture of what Peter's trying to say. For if we're going to call God Lord and call God our Father, then we should conduct ourselves in a way that, that reflects our reverence for him as Lord and as Father. When we were young, we were being brought up by our parents, we could be motivated in our behavior by our fear and reverence for our parents. Just wait till your dad gets home. I used to hear that sometimes. Or I always remember the day my mom said to my dad, talk to your son. And my dad looked at me and said, hi, Jeff. And my mom was like, that's not what I meant. <laughs> and from that point on, no longer feared. <laughs> he shouldn't have done that. But I mean, we were motivated by, by fear and reverence. We would try to do things that would not disappoint them. I remember talking to Rob one day, and you talked about the power of disappointment, right? As a, as a, as a father or a teacher, as a parent figure, that, that's, a, it's the, that's a powerful way to encourage young people to, to do the things that they should. So we would try not to dis disappoint. We would try not to do things that would cause us to get in trouble or, or have them not trust us. But there's a positive flip side to this idea of fear and reverence as well. For, for, be, for because of how we feel about our parents, we will want to do things not just to not disappoint them, but to actually make them smile and to make them proud of us. And one way to battle temptation is to focus on doing the things that will make our Heavenly Father smile. Focus on the things that will please Him. I often quote lyrics from my favorite Christian rock band, Petra, and they have a song called God Pleaser. And the lyrics go, I just want my life to glorify his son, to make my father proud that I'm his child before I'm done. No need to slap me on the back or stop to shake my hand. I just want to hear my father say, well done, well done. And yet day after day, temptation surrounds us wanting us to do things that will make us smile, if only for a fleeting moment, to do things that will make our lives easier, but not really set apart. And Peter's encouragement is to set our minds on what is ahead, to set our minds on God and his purpose for our lives as a means of overcoming temptation. Verse 13 tells us to gird our minds for action. In other words, to protect what goes into our minds and to prepare our thoughts for what God would have us to do. For it is out of our thoughts that our behavior is born. The battle of temptation is fought in the mind. And when a temptation goes through our mind, we have the choice to let it sit there and make a home there and eventually grow into a behavior or a habit or even a character. Or we can take captive that thought weigh it against from what we, what we know about God is right and wrong. And then if we determine it's wrong, we chuck it out with the Lord's help. Not every thought that comes our way has to be welcomed. One of my favorite sayings of recent years, it's been attributed to a lot of different people, so I don't know who first said it, but I like it. It says, you can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. That's deep. But tempting thoughts are going to fly by. That's the way it is in this world. The question is, are you going to welcome them in? Are you going to let them come in for a landing, and build a nest, and make a home? Because once you do, it isn't long before they impact your behavior. Swindoll writes, if we tolerate temptation long enough, 
we'll end up acting out what we think. I've heard it said that what one generation tolerates, the next generation celebrates. Temptation towards sin is properly seen as temptation to be avoided by one generation. The next generation maybe isn't keen on fully accepting the temptation, but they don't reject it either. They begin to tolerate it. Behavior that misses the mark of God's desires for us begin to be tolerated. And by the next generation, that behavior becomes fully accepted and part of their worldview. What was once considered a temptation to be avoided is now considered a valid choice, just as valid as any other. And this is seen working out in a societal level and also as individuals. And as Christians, we have been set free from the penalty of sin as well as from the power that sin has over us. Christ broke the chains that held us to our futile way of life, the scripture says. God has opened the door to a new life where we're, we're free to follow him and free to serve him, free to fulfill our, his purpose for our lives. The temptation is always, is always there to go back to where we once were. But when that temptation comes, fix your eyes on what you're becoming, what you have become and what you're becoming. Fix your eyes on what Jesus is doing in your life and where he is taking you. Why would you go back? Why would you go back? I've always liked Chuck Swindoll's writings because he is spiritually deep, but also very practical. And in this chapter, he, he line, outlines four techniques to remember, four ways to find hope beyond temptation, ways to gird up our minds for actions, to be sober in spirit, to be holy and set apart for God, to, to live in reverence of God and to, to keep moving further away from our old, futile way of life. Four practical things to remember as we live in a culture that is in many ways working to move us away from where God is calling us to be. So the first point he makes is to pay close attention to what you look at. Pay close attention to what you look at. The eyes are what feeds the mind in so many ways. More powerful, I think, than the other senses. And in today's society, we are bombarded by visual images. A few years back, I was at a conference for youth pastors, and the, the speaker said to us, in challenging us, how do we reach young people? He said, how do you, how are we going to reach a generation that listens with their eyes? How do we reach a generation that listens with their eyes? When we, what we let into our eyes is such a powerful determinant of how we will behave. Do you continually look at things that cause you to envy and feel dissatisfied with what you have, wishing you had what they had? Do you continue to look at things that, that bring up anger or provoke you to violence? Look at things that entice lust? There has never been more opportunity than in the last 20 years for humans to feast their eyes on things that will damage their soul. Now, let me be practical, like Swindoll. If the internet has become an issue for you or for someone you love in terms of where your eyes go, I want to introduce you to a very practical accountability software called Covenant Eyes. It's an excellent tool for helping internet users keep their eyes where they should and to be sober in spirit and mind. It's so good that one denomination I know provides it free of charge for all their pastors just as a preventative tool. So you can look up Covenant Eyes online if you think that would be helpful to you, or I can give you some info about it if you'd like. Secondly, Swindoll suggests to give greater thought to the consequences of sin rather than its pleasures. The Bible does not deny that there is pleasure in sin for a season, but it also makes very clear that sin by its very nature brings about many negative consequences, contrary to the purposes that God has for our lives. The Canadian band Great Big C had a song years ago that's called Consequence Free. And they say, I want to be consequence free. I want to be where nothing needs to matter. And one of the verses says how great it would be to slip off the edge and not have to worry about the fall. But it's interesting, in the lines I mentioned to you from the, the chorus, they give an answer to their own questions. They, For when you are consequence free, then nothing matters, even positive consequences. There's no delight in loving, no satisfaction in doing good, no returning in a friendship when you reach out for friendship. It's one thing to wish that nothing matters on the negative side, 
that we can do whatever we want and be consequence-free, but if nothing matters as far as negative consequences, then nothing matters in terms of positive ones either. Consequences are given to us as warnings. An edge, by definition, has a drop to it. Otherwise, it's not an edge. Knowing that there is a fall on the other side of that edge is our warning to stay away from that edge. Commuting in Montreal many years ago, I always found, Erica, right, the best way to not fall into the subway hole where the train's coming is to not go past that yellow, was it yellow or was it red? I forget. <laughs> not go past that yellow line and not go near the edge. It warned us, of, it was a warning against the consequences. There are consequences to every action. And believe it or not, they're a gift from God. Joy is a blessing for good actions. Pain is suffering as a warning to avoid bad actions. When you're tempted to dwell on thoughts that lead to actions, we need to seriously consider the consequences. Not just the fleeting pleasure at the beginning, but the consequences that logically follow the actions. Years ago when I was with Youth for Christ, we did a concert in the band shell, right? Band shell? And um, with a lot of Christian rock groups and you know, music that would, it would cater to young people. And we had a speaker one day come and he was, um, he was serving 25 to life in Workworth. I think it was in Workworth, was he in Kingston? And um, he, but he became a Christian in prison and had actually completed many Bible college courses, completed his high school education, was a model prisoner. He was brought into, you know, sent out onto a farm, you know, lower security where people serving 25 to life just aren't sent there. And he was given day passes four days, four times a year to go and speak to young people. We had him come and do an assembly at, at Port Hope High School, but we had him come and speak. And uh, he talked about the situation that ended, ended, that had him end up in jail. And his main point was he didn't think about it. He just went along with the rest of the gang and acted impulsively was his words. And that's how he ended up where he was. And his words to the young people there was, don't act impulsively. Think about the consequences. There are always consequences that need to be considered. And those consequences are there for us, for our good, as a warning. Swindoll suggests, force yourself to give greater thought to the painful consequences than to the pl passing pleasures of sin. Third, a way to live in hope beyond temptation is to begin each day by renewing your sense of reverence for God. Start each day by talking to the Lord, even if it's brief. Remind yourself of who you belong to. Remind yourself of what he's done for you in redeeming you from your futile way of life. Give him your weakness and let him give you his strength in exchange for the challenges of the day. I gotta admit, I'm not a morning person. Morning, early morning devotions have always been a ch struggle for me. But what a difference it makes in my day if I just take even a couple of minutes to let the first thoughts of my day be focused on Christ and on his plans and his purposes for my life that day. Finally, Swindoll suggests to periodically during each day focus fully on Christ. Just as we would take a coffee break in our work every once in a while during the day to, to rest and refocus, take a Jesus break a few times a day. Stop and examine yourself and see, you know, where you're going that day, where you may, might be starting to buy into the world's way of thinking. See where you might be losing sight of God's purpose for your life that day. Just take a couple of minutes and refocus your mind, refocus your attention on Christ. The battle, as we said, for temptation, battle with temptation takes place in the mind. So by refocusing our minds on Christ throughout the day, we dampen temptation's power and give ourselves more strength and motivation for any future battle. Let me add one last practical step to Swindoll's four. When faced with temptation, always look for a way of escape. Always look for a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has taken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Every temptation we face has been, has been faced by someone before. You're not alone. 
And God is faithful, and he will be available to you, giving you the strength to defeat temptation and to move on according to God's plans for your life. And one of the ways he helps us do that and move past temptation is by giving us a way out, a way of escape. If you're old like me, you remember in the 1970s, there was this comedian who had a TV show. His name was Flip Wilson. And uh, one of, he, had, he had different characters, and one of his characters was a, he dressed up like a woman, and her name was Geraldine, and Geraldine had, Geraldine had attitude. And whenever someone would kind of, you know, accuse her of doing something wrong, she would stick her hand on her hips, and she would say, the devil made me do it. The thing is, the devil cannot make you do anything. We always have a choice. And now I recognize sometimes temptation can be so powerful that it seems like we have no choice. But the truth is that Jesus has broken the chains and will always, always give you a way of escape. When you find yourself in the rut of temptation, heading towards choices that aren't for your best, God will always provide a way for you to get out of that rut. Sometimes the way out is very subtle, and you may have to look hard to find it, and sometimes it's so obvious it hits you like a ton of bricks. But either way, we need to watch for that way of escape and take that instrument of grace that God has provided for us. Oscar Wilde was wrong. One of the most freeing thoughts we could have is the knowledge that we don't have to give in to temptation. You don't have to. Just because the thoughts enter your head, it doesn't mean you have to act on them. Just because the thoughts are moving closer to becoming actions doesn't mean that God won't provide for you a way of escape somewhere along the way to help get your mind back on track. And just because you may give in to temptation, it doesn't mean it has to become a life pattern. God's grace is available to forgive. God's power is available to restore. God's faithfulness is there to sustain us and to help us walk the path that God has called us to walk. A path that may be surrounded by temptation, but it's a path which we can walk in freedom. Eyes fixed on Jesus, minds focused on living a life set apart for him, a life that makes our Heavenly Father smile. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you that when we become Christians, you send your Holy Spirit to live within us and to walk with us daily through the challenges of, of life. And one of the challenges we face many times is temptation. First of all, Lord, I pray that you would give us a heightened sense of what is right and what is wrong. In this relative world we live in, where everyone's opinion and choices are equally valid. Help us to know, Lord God, that you have set before us life and death. You have set before us right and wrong. Help us, Lord, to make choices that make you, make you smile, to make choices that line up with the purposes and plan that you have for our lives. And Lord, the enemy of our souls is constantly trying to get us off track and constantly trying to tempt us. And I pray, Father, that you would help us, that you'd help us to, to be insulated within your, your spirit, insulated within who you are and who you've made us. Help us, Lord, to realize that, that temptation itself is not a sin, that, that thoughts are going to go through our minds. Help us, Lord, to just Open the front door and open the back door and let them just go right through. Give us the strength, Lord, and the courage and the power to not let them make a nest, to not let them settle so that they eventually become a behavior or even a, a character. I pray, Lord, that whatever temptations we're facing, that you would help us to, uh, to take that time every day to refocus on you. First thing in the morning, as we live our day, help us, Lord, to look for that way of escape that you always provide. Help us to realize the truth that 
that we don't have to give in, that, we, that there are options in you. Father, I just pray that you'd help us to put these truths into practice in our day-to-day -day lives and help us, Lord, to pass them on to our children and our grandchildren who are more affected than any other by society's worldview. Help us, Lord, to build, res by your spirit, to build resiliency in them so that they will know how to recognize sin and how to overcome temptation so that they may live the lives that you've called them to and live out their purpose for, that you've created them for. Father, we all have our one big thing. We all have our one thing that is the, the big hurdle in our lives when it comes to temptation. And I pray, Lord, that even now as that thing comes to mind, we would just even now lay them at your feet and recommit ourselves once again to working with you and to allowing you to work in us so that we might be set apart, so that we might live lives that are holy, so that we might gird our minds for action and live lives that are sober and live lives that fulfill what you've called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.